now with uh, her presentation, Man Secluded from Work from the Company of Women is a Dangerous Animal to Society, the New Historical Genre of the History of Women in Scotland's Enlightenment. Go ahead. <laughs> Whenever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can you hear me, Tony? You're there. Yes, I can. It is a, a real pleasure for me to be here in the flesh with you, and uh, it is a, a honor to speak after Tony. The two papers have some points in common. The first is that of chronology. I shall also speak about the 70s and about the new symbolic and material role played by women. But I will do this by focusing neither on France nor on Switzerland, but on Scotland, and not on the works written by women, but on a historical genre taking shape at the time, the history of women, as it was conceived by male Scottish historians. I will also pay attention to women's labor, but more in relation to the other meaning of the term labor, that is childbirth. Scottish historians, from Adam Smith to Lord Keynes to William Robertson and John Miller, contributed to the formulation of a new historical approach, which regarded chronology and looked at issues of universal scope, such as modes of subsistence and laws, habits and customs, sexual and family relations, passions, thoughts, and sentiments. <laughs> Um, they uh, shifted the attention from kings and heroes to the root of people towards civilization, a neologism of the 1750s, which in Scotland, as well as in France, became a key word for designing the historical process from barbarism to civil society. Women, until then, had been excluded from archetypal histories that were, by, by, by and large, centered on the political arena, assumed a, a pivotal, pivotal role within this new framework. So as Barbara Taylor has put it, the Scottish Enlightenment, of course, sponsored one of the most far-reaching and innovative inquiries into womanhood in Western history, laid the foundation for what we call today gender history. This is why Scottish Enlightenment historiography is a privileged locus to examine gender tensions. What interests me here is to investigate the relationship of the Scottish historiography between the specific historical progress of women and the general, universal, as well as natural progress of men. I suggest that women were at once included and excluded from the historical mechanics. When Scottish philosophers talked about men, the science of men, and the history of men, they used the language of universalism, aiming at the general and universal science of his and the history. The science and history also included women. By contrast, they did not use such a universal language to speak about women, but the language of the peculiarity and the specificity. The specificity can be in tension with and even free against the universalism. So my questions here are, what is the part played by women within the universal history of mankind and civilization written by the Scottish Enlightenment? Did women act and change the course of history independently from men? How did the relationship between the sexes change over time? In this paper, I intend to explore tensions and ambivalences about gender, which I consider endemic to, Scot to Scottish historiography. I focus on three different aspects of, of these tensions, possibly two, because I'm not sure that they will arrive and continue. <laughs> First, I'll um, deal with the civilizing role assigned to women as agents of culture in the process leading, leading to commercial societies. The relationship between the sexes was described as changed over time. Within the historical process, both men and women reached their pure humanity. Women freed themselves from the yoke of male masters. Men, in turn, acceded to polite manners and became more humane. If potentially universal, this progress was specific and situated. As according to a shared narrative, it had historically happened in Europe. 
and especially in a part of Europe, to which Spain, but also Portugal, Italy, and Eastern Europe, for example, remain marginal. So my second part will examine how the progress of feminist sex was entangled with the peculiar history of European civilization. Attention to sexuality contributed to crystallize the differences between peoples and distinguish Europeans from the rest of the world. I close this point by mentioning the different geography of civilization within Europe. My final point will deal with the other side of this same discourse, the ambiguities and instabilities in modern and commercial societies of Europe. These were expressed in the fear that progress could be reversed into its contrary, turning the civilizing femininity into decadent effeminacy. The positive revelation of women had its downside in the Scottish Enlightenment. The celebration of the feminine virtues ended up to imprison women within them, let's say, within the feminine virtues itself, so to set the precise limits to civilization. In his lecture, you can change, thank you. In his lecture on jurisprudence given at the University of Glasgow in the early 1760s and perhaps earlier, Adam Smith formulated an idea of human progress that was to become a shared historical framework for the Scottish Enlightenment. It allowed it outline uh, the development of humankind from civilization towards civil society through successive stages of socioeconomic development. This is a classical formulation. There is uh, there are four distinct states which man mankind pass through. First, this the age of hunter. Secondly, the age of shepherd. Thirdly, the age of culture, and fourthly, the age of commerce. This process was both natural and historical. It was the result of a uniform and perfectible human nature, which evolved by degrees from the simple and rough life of savages to complex and polite commercial societies. Smith explained that in the first hunting stage, people lived with simple tribes with no institution, no laws, and no property. They were few in numbers because these precarious ways of subsistence could not guarantee the survival of the many. Amerindians were the historical example of this stage. Increasing population required a more secure a source of subsistence, attention to the increasing of population, please, and triggered the passage to the second stage based on pasturage. In the shepherd state, legislative and political systems started to develop. With agriculture, the political body became more and more complex, and the activities in which peoples were engaged diversified, giving way to the divisional level. This led to the final commercial stage, a date of which stood Britain. The transition from, from one mode of subsistence to another depended on population growth in the early stages, whereas the shift from a farming to a commercial society was linked to the divisional level. This schematic description, from which women are apparently absent, and this is a point which is very emphasized by historiography, but which, in my view, is decisive in order to evaluate the role played by the female sex within federal history. In their reproductive capacity, as bearers of the species, women were the cause and the primal models of human progress. Indeed, without population increase, the savage stage would never have been uh, the savage sta uh, stage would have been perpetual, as it supposedly was the case of the Rebellions, who were considered not attractive by women. In other words, historical progress that relied upon main productive activities of hunting, herding, farming, and trading was enabled by and so depended upon a previous sexual and reproductive level by women. Despite its impact, this female level was never fully acknowledged by Scottish historians, perhaps because they considered breeding as a passive act. What is certain, however, is that the issue of population acquired enormous importance in 18th century political economy, which put women on the stage. When attention is paid to the outcome of historical progress, the presence of women is ubiquitous. Women embodied the ethos and, uh, of transaction and conversation with a single semantic field. The term of commerce, the essence of awareness of the modern, uh, of the modern for the Scots, meant not just economic exchanges, but also social, cultural, 
cultural and sexual intercourses. Here, I stress the point, the point that uh, has been already emphasized by Jeremy and yesterday. The human puts the relationship between men and women at the foundation of a new ethics, which became a paradigmatic of civilization and modern freedom as such. No more work like virtues and participation shown in public life, but emancipation from material needs and polite manners. In John Popper's formulation, Hume and after him, Smith and John Miller replaced I quote, the police by politeness, the oikos by the economy. In place of the classical citizen master of the grand family and arts, appear a fluid, historical, and transactional vision of all father and mercator, shaping himself through the stages of history. In the route from civilization to civil society, men became more and more sociable, leaving behind a historical existence and entering the society of conversation, thanks to the relationship with women. The company with women shaped the distinctive features of modern commercial society, where industry, knowledge, and humanity were linked together by an industrial, indissoluble chain. I'm not reading the quotation, it's only the end. Luxury, generally associated with the image of women, became a dynamic element of well-being and social mobility. What precisely the differentiated modern liberty from ancient liberty in Hume's analysis? Hume does emphasize a sharp distinction between civilization and uh, barbarism on the basis of the different relationship between the sexes. I don't read again this quotation, but please note two points. First, the, diver the divergence between barbarous nations and polite uh, peoples revealed a clear improvement in manners, where women's influence on men was crucial in producing sympathy and sensibility, so that the new homo economicus was, I quote, human, a better citizen and a better man. Second, this was a polite prayer for greater politeness in the relationship between the sexes and not a call for correction of the fundamental social, political, and legal inequalities that structured relations between men and women in the 18th century Britain. Indeed, men's superiority remained rooted in nature. You can see as nature has given men the superiority of women, etc. Hume's remarks uh, found a fundamental place in the diachronic model of the uh, in history, uh, of the study of histories. Here I just uh, quoted some of uh, the, the work I'm going to quote now. So John Miller, Professor of Law at Glasgow, opened his origin of distinction of France with a chapter on France and condition of women in different ages. The judge of the court of session, Herbert in Home Law case, devoted one of his sketches of this young man to the progress of the female sex. The Edinburgh physician with Alexander published in two volumes the first work in Scotland entirely dedicated to the history of women, encompassing all national strength and thesis from the early antiquities to the present time. Yeah. John Gregory, also a physician, gave the female sex a pivotal role in his comparative view of the state of and faculties of men with those of the animal world, and authored one of the most influential 18th century conduct books. Other legacies to this project. In the future, emerging from studial histories, women were condemned to a state of misery among savages who lived in a hostile environments, coupled promiscuously and disregarded family. Miller defined this as a mortified feature. Being never inferior in physical strength and courage, women were treated as the slaves and as the heroes of the other sex. However, the study model promised emancipation from the very beginning in connection with the gradual development of human societies. You can see what William Roberts was summarizing in his influential history of America. So that women are indebted to the refinement of polished manners for a healthy change of their state is the point which cannot be allowed. Society moved from a new barbarism dominated by the masculine warrior values towards the world of conversation and commerce in which the feminine qualities of sociability and kindness prevailed. Promiscuity was replaced by monogamous marriage, also with the idea of chastity, which becomes a kind of myth, and the relationship between the sexes moralized and moved from a mere animal instinct to the two of 
the instinct of reproduction to love. This marked the improvement of women's condition from which the entire social body benefited. Indeed, only female company could generate civil manners, high feelings, and fine arts, so that no society could even rise when women were excluded. It is within this shared narrative that William Alexander first the a social character of men is the pride of the company of women, and this is, uh, was the title of my uh, speech. Um, men excluded from the company of women is not only rough and uncultivated, but a dangerous animal to society. The process of material development of the refinement of manners and of knowledge were so closely linked to the improvement, um, to the improving condition of women, that a balanced relationship between the sexes became emblematic of the progressive study. The status of women would thus become the parameter to measure the degree of civilization attained by different societies. And uh, Alexander expressed this point in the clearest and the ambiguous terms. It's a very, very interesting. I don't know why it, it, it's, uh, you don't see it all. Um, the PowerPoint doesn't enter, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Just pay attention to the constantly. Uh, to the fact that there is a constant law, and uh, especially uh, the, the, the part in which it, that starts with the rank, the poor conditions in which we find women in any country back out to us with the greater precision, the exact point in the scale of civil society. So when you have no other sources, it's enough to see how women are treated in order to understand the degree of civilization. From this statement, Silvana Tomazelli has rightly suggested, that now 40 years ago, that for the late Scottish historians, the process of civilization corresponded to a process of feminization. Society became civil when it gradually abandoned its masculine features of war and violence for embodied the feminine values of commerce, conversation, and sympathy. Civilization met, however, precise limits within the universal histories of the Scottish Enlightenment. The emancipated woman who had been placed at the apex of the social progress and at the heart of commercial society was a distinctive feature of a portion only of the cosmos, that is Europe or rather a part of it. She was seen both as a historical product of the and the historical cause of Europe, Europe's distinction in contrast with the rest of the world. This was where enlightened philosophical history with conflicted identities and hierarchies. In its attempt to embrace the whole humanity under a simple glance, Scottish historiography was universal and universalistic. As far as it considered that the savage could develop into the civilized man, the unity of the human species was maintained. However, this cause also gave shape to a hierarchy for the rich world, where the supposed paralysis of savage societies remained forever in contrast with the dynamism of civil Europeans. The comparative approach on which Scottish philosophical history was concentrated made it possible to think of the universal in a global world, but also highlighted the difference in development, engendering a dialectics between the image of progress as a universal process and the persistent and deep differences that existed among peoples. This is why, in my view, unity and differences constituted the essence of the Scottish history of the human species, a point that I use especially in my book on the Scottish Enlightenment. The progress of the female sex was considered as a specific European phenomenon and so deeply entangled with the history of Europe. I cannot develop this point. I just stressed that Scots found the root of modern Europe in what Miller called the Gothic Age. In their narrative, the Crusades restored the spirit of commerce. So commerce, chivalry, and Christianity marked a revolution in manners which allowed women to emerge from their service status. To, from the, the change concerned, in particular, the customs of fighting and of sexual relations, war and love. This morning we were speaking about war and love. Women were thus in debt to this medieval heritage, but if Europe accessed to wealth, justice, and civility rested on its historically distinctive Roman and German inheritance, after the fall of the Roman Empire, a crucial question arises. How far is this kind of legacy acceptable to non-Europeans? It is not, basically. 
the distinctive European history, characterized by commerce and sociability, becomes evident as soon as sector relations are compared on a global scale. Following Buffon's natural history, Scottish historians dealt with comparative sexualities seen as a crucial marker of differentiations among peoples. Africans were described as having an excessive and animal sexuality and practicing general promiscuity. Travelers largely diffused the idea that African women gave birth without pain and that their painless breast pain changed with allowed them to nurse children over their shoulders while working in the fields, so to provide a formidable justification of slavery. This is a very violent image uh, that I have taken um, from Jennifer Morgan. Mm. Mm. Um, by th their sex and body, African women were depicted as uh, unwomanly, but fit for both productive and reproductive labor, as Jennifer Morgan has shown in the most convincing way. Can you change the word? Sexuality, they say this is a little less violent, but it's the same principle. Sexuality, slavery, and slavery converged in the construction of the economic, political order of the Enlightenment. The need of the Rambutan, can you change this, uh, carrying off the Negro girls became, not surprisingly, an important component of the discourse concerning the diversity of Africans and their supposed proximity to AIDS. By stressing the strong similitudes in their sexual practices and organs of reproduction, the vehement appetite of the male for the females, I've been quoting before, the same conformation of genitals, the periodic emanations of the females, um, Dupont explained why AIDS and often thoughts found the perfect agreement in excessive sexuality, lasciviousness, and depravity. Uh, Linnaeus went further by classifying the orangutan together with the Homo sapiens as the as two species of the human kind. So this is uh, the frontispiece, uh, and uh, I write uh, almost the per uh, the per oh, right. ah, okay. <laughs> the the unnatural uh, sexuality <laughs> of an Indian I mean, the <laughs> yeah. of an Indian man constituted the opposite extreme. Of African exes. With long hair and their great faces, they appear cold, effeminate, and destitute of uh, one sign of manhood and strength. Just consider that uh, I have time. This is uh, one of the frontispieces of the tra translation into English of the 1790s uh, of Linnaeus. Uh, and it's quite interesting because, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the frontispiece of uh, uh, the book of science, uh, of, of natural history, for excellence. So, on the other side, there are the Americans who are cold, uh, with long hair, and effeminate. Um, in the materialistic logic of the four stages theory, the indifference from male and male Indians toward the female sex had its most important consequences in the lack of population increase, what we have seen at the beginning, uh, and then uh, in the lack of progress itself. To be imprisoned in the savage stage, the Scottish historians understood the American and the Indians to be, was a negative fulfillment of the history's promise of human progress. Represented as chorus in war and intensive and insensitive in love, they were the, the foils of the image of the chivalrous knight, which had created modern Europe. They are exactly the contrary. An unequal geography of historical progress emerges, supported by the aggregated landscape of the sentimental world. America appeared as the land of the defective love, Asia and Africa as those of carnal excitement and unbridled sexuality. Europe emerged as the location of true love, uh, the historical result of the refinement of passion over either the portion of coldness or the animal appetite of savage and barbarian societies. But the Scottish historians also stressed some differences within Europe. Spain was described as the place where, I quote from Miller, um, uh, where from the defects of administration or from whatever causes, the arts have for a long time been almost entirely neglected. And so the state and accomplishment of the of women have been slower than in other countries of Europe. France especially, the contrast is especially France uh, uh, Spain. But according to Miller, 
even Spain, and I stress even Spain, uh, women started to be admitted to that freedom which uh, they had in other countries of Europe. Others emphasized more the differences between the peoples of Europe, stressing the space backwardness, which was mirrored by the violence of the conquest of the new world. And the two things are very often together. In the practice of segregating women, um, if the practice sorry, of segregating women seemed to have fallen into disuse, William Alexander deplored that a quote, Spain is a kingdom whose inhabitants we are less acquainted with and less able to characterize than the Ottomans or the India on the banks of the Ganges. So, uh, I have the five minutes. Or? Yeah. Okay. However, the positive process of civilization and feminization that Europe has experienced in its historical path and from which it distinguished itself from the rest of the world was far from being a stable one, according to the scholars. So the last part of my talk points out very quickly um, the constant sense of instability and that danger which accompanied the Scottish Enlightenment discourse about civilization. Here again, gender is a central category that cannot be dissected. The point is that the new position that women had acquired in civil society induced anxiety, even in the most convinced, supported of modernity including Hume, Smith, and Mila. They all worried that the positive process of feminization would spill into frightful ephemerality. Fear about the confusion of gender roles was the elect motive to which Scottish historians answer by invoking the necessity to establish checks and laws in order to regulate the relationship between the sexes and to guarantee the family without this control society risk dissolution. The very logic of the Scottish study, study of typology can help to explain this proper concern. The stage theory, as we have seen, assigned to women um, a past and a history which inescapably started with the house level and gradually moved towards her emancipation from the uh, main master. This suggests not only that her history was distinct from that of men, but also that in many respects it was in conflict with his. Appealing again to Silvana Tomazel, the lucid formulation, the history of the tyranny men had exercised over women and this gradual reversal by women with the advancement of Polish society became constitutive of the knowledge about her or of her as an object of knowledge. I think that this is an important point. In other words, the inherent risks of the process of feminization was since the very beginning an inversion of the gender power relationship, which opened to what the Scots considered a highly problematic consequences of civilization, the competition between the sexes. I will do my uh, story very brief and I arrive at a jump to the conclusion. The use of gender uh, discourse within Scottish histories was accompanied so by constant concerts about women's ascendancy, which undermined the potential for their emancipation inherent in the progressive view. <coughs> in the theory of moral sentiments, uh, even Smith expressed worries about the masculating effects of social progress, stating that, I quote, the delicate sensibility required in civilized nations sometimes destroys the masculine firmness of the character. So the problem of masculinity is also there, of course. In Europe civil societies, luxury, which Hume, Smith, and Robertson had seen as the main factors leading to the collapse of feudalism, had started, according to this Smith, to affect the crucial issue of women's mm -hmm. capacity to reason. This is a, one of the great problems. Can we change this? In contrast with the regular reproduction of famous animals, women's fertility was in constant and dependent on many variable factors, such as manners, of, uh, manners uh, uh, with different ways of things in kings, passions, fantasies, caprichos, or fear of losing beauty. While laborers' propagation responded to the laws of the market as any other commodity, upper class women escape the general rule disposing them to natural priests. And this is the quotation from, uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't know why the quotation of uh, cat, 
Monarchy, uh, though in no doubt it's courageous, does not always prevent marriage. It seems to be favorable to generation. Uh, a half starved Highland woman frequently bears, bears more than 20 children, while a pampered fine lady, lady is often incapable of bearing them and is generally exhausted uh, by two or three. Baroness, so frequent among women of fashion, is very rare among those of imperial station. Luxury in the first sense, while it inflates perhaps the passion of enjoyment, seems always to weaken and frequently to destroy altogether the powers of generation. You understand the, the question of sequel. See if uh, it's uh, uh, the labor of women is the very beginning of progress and the capacity of progress in the very moment in which women decided not to give uh, birth. They destroy the same progress. So, final point: if uh, they in conclusion, if the reproductive powers of women bodies allow the history to escape the confinement in the savage stage, the same female body was the ground on which the collapse of historical progress was also figured. This happened when sexual enjoyment was disjointed from progression. Women were thus ambivalently replaced in relation to civilization. Their primordial reproductive level and then their connection with commerce, taste, and politeness made of them the conditio sine qua non for its realization. But their excess and ostentation in the advanced stages engendered the emasculation of manners and morals, leading finally to the collapse of society itself. May fear that the refined sensibilities of the commercial woman degenerated into savage passions and sensual pleasures made manifest the potential circularity of the social progress. With the spread of unregulated sexuality, egoism prevailed and sympathy and feeling disappeared, just as it was, I quote, in the age of rudeness and barbarism. In the general interest of society, the quotation, require that the same sex be kept under control. While men freed themselves from natural through the historical process, the natural will of woman seek to set unsurmountable limits to her own history.